Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, opening keynote plenary is nothing private anymore. I'm Claire Fox. I'm the director of the Institute of Ideas. Um, thank you for coming along. I know that there's stiff competition and seven of the debates happening in, uh, throughout the Barbican as we speak. But I'm glad that you came to this one because this session is very uh, core to the themes of the festival this year on the confusion between the public and private spheres, which is something that runs throughout at least a third of the uh, 80 uh, panel debates that we've got over the weekend. There is, of course, lots of concerns about invasions on our privacy. We're always reading in the media and uh, worries about government surveillance. And the idea, slightly conspiratorially put sometimes, that everybody's kind of watching us and spying on us. And there's a concern about corporations like Google and Facebook that they're collecting data uh, and so on. So there's lots of uh, concerns about our privacy as the public being invaded. And yet, culturally, we seem prepared to let it all hang out. Um, because just as much as we're concerned about the big corporates at Facebook spying on us, we're also um, telling everybody everything about ourselves on Facebook and on Twitter. And there's a sense in which we're prepared to reveal our intimate secrets much more. So there's obviously some sort of uh, contradictions going on there. And we know that there's a, a demands for transparency, that everything should be known, that's fairly ubiquitous, that every conversation should be on the record, um, that even leaking and whistleblowing is now considered to be kind of a positive thing to do. So there's something about everything being out in the public sphere that's very popular at the moment. I particularly find distasteful, by the way, in terms of our private lives, the new Channel 4 series Sex Box, uh, which I was talking about earlier, which is, is that we seem to think that this is a serious public service uh, that we'll have sex on it's not even pornography. I mean, in some ways, I wish they'd show the sex. It just seems so distasteful to me that it's live, but you don't see it. Uh, the whole thing is, like, ridiculous. I can see that's the quote, isn't it? Claire what's live sex. Anyway, but I'm just saying that we... So we don't seem to know what should be private, uh, what should be public, and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot going on there, and um, what, that's the sort of things that I, I, I want our panel to discuss. But there's an awful lot there. Uh, there's too much for them to possibly cover in the five to seven minutes to which they've been allotted. I'll explain the format just because it's the first session. You'll get familiar with it through the weekend for those of you who are new. So I ask the speakers to prepare just their thoughts, five to seven minutes, really as an intellectual provocation, fairly conversational. This is not an academic conference with papers and so on. They're going to tell you uh, their ideas. We're then going to have a brief conversation, pulling that together at the end, where we can kind of just see where we disagree and where we agree. But we're very much then opening up that conversation to you. And in a way, it's a public conversation about these issues. It's not a Q&A session. These aren't the experts that you ask questions to. It's opening up the conversation for your thoughts and your ideas, and just like uh, to try out and see whether we can tease out some of the themes. So let me introduce the panel in the order in which they'll speak. First up, we'll be hearing from Christine Rosen, who is a fellow at the uh, New American Foundation, has come all the way from Washington, and we're delighted to have her. It's her first time uh, speaking at the Battle of Ideas, although we've wanted her to speak before, so we're delighted to have her here. She writes about the intersection um, of uh, technology and culture, um, and is speaking at a number of sessions throughout the, uh, the weekend, including the, uh, the session on data collection, uh, one on guns in America, I think, actually, and uh, Changing America, and also the final plenary on, on great books. Uh, she also writes about uh, contemporary bioethics, and she's one of the foundation editors of New Atlantis. Next up, and returning for a second year, is Andrew Keane. Andrew is, uh, will be well known to many of you as the internet entrepreneur who uh, founded audiocafe.com and <coughs> is currently host of uh, Keen On Show, which is a popular tech, non tech crunch chat show. He's a columnist for CNN. He's the author of the international hit Cult of the Amateur, How the Internet is Killing Our Culture, uh, which has been translated into 17 languages. He's the author of the uh, Digital Vertigo, How Today's Social Revolution is Dividing, Diminishing and Disorientating Us, a very uh, controversial critique of social media. And last year, actually, on one of the panels I was at, he, he talked about this tension between knowing what was public and private and kind of made me think that wouldn't be an appropriate theme for this year, so we thought we'd better invite him back as he gave me the idea. Next up will be Ursula Martinez, who's the 
cult cabaret diva, uh, in her own words, but very true. Uh, she's a writer and a perf performer of the likes of Me, 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 a series of autobiographical and confessional works which was presented at the Barbican uh, a few years ago. Her most famous work to date is probably the magic striptease cabaret act Hanky Panky, which went viral when illicitly posted online. Um, and that led her to create uh, My Stories, Your Emails, a solo theatre show, which she and I have discussed and which we felt fitted in with many of the themes here today um, on the public and private thing. We're delighted to have her here. And we'll have um, David Aronovich, to those of you in Britain certainly you'd be very well known, the must-read columnist at the Times, also a regular contributor to the Jewish Chronicle. He's won the George Orwell Prize for political journalism twice, uh, published a book on conspiracy theory entitled Voodoo Histories, and uh, more recently has sometimes shared the moral maze when I've been on the panel, so now I'm chairing him, so now it's vengeance. <laughs> uh, and uh, very important for this session, but also a great honour and tribute to him, I think. He was recently appointed the chair of Index on Censorship, one of the most important organisations, I think, that we have in this country. So we're delighted to have David here. He's a regular but great <laughs> Finally, we're here from Professor Frank Faradi, who's an associate at the Centre for Parenting and uh, Culture Studies at the University of Kent in Canterbury, uh, visiting professor at the Institute of Risk and Disaster uh, Reduction at UCL. He's a regular media don, often on the radio, TV, and writes newspaper columns and so on. Speaks all around the world on a wide variety of topics, covered by the wide variety of topics that he's written many, many books on, uh, well-acclaimed books. And just to mention a few, um, Wasted, Why Education is Not Education, on tolerance, a defence of moral independence, and being launched here at the Battle of Ideas tomorrow, authority, a sociological history. He's a regular battle speaker. He's always interesting. Can we give him a warm welcome? <laughs> Christine, kick us off, please. All right, thank you, Claire. So the Delphic Oracle's advice to mankind and womankind was know thyself. Today, I think it would be show thyself. So what I want to talk about a little bit in the few minutes I have and hopefully during our discussion is why every day we willfully, enthusiastically violate our own privacy. Um, we are Instagram selfies, our Twitter feeds, our Facebook status updates. Um, you can know just about anything about anyone if they choose to violate their own privacy. And I think when it comes to government surveillance or even tech company surveillance of its users, we tend to have a pretty strong reaction to that. We have an opinion about those violations of privacy. But when it comes to talking about why we violate our own privacy, we're a lot more muddled. And I think that's because it's an instinct. We have a deep instinct for privacy that we often don't understand exists until it's violated. But I want to make a little argument about how our technologies play into that. I think our software and our machines are actually designed to elicit more information from us and um, has in have encouraged us to em embrace the constant revelations that we feed them. Now, in his new dystopian novel, uh, The Circle, the fiction, American fiction writer Dave Eggers uh, has a corporation called The Circle with the nefarious intent to have uh, perpetual surveillance of everyone, and they have some interesting slogans. It's the corporate slogan for The Circle is, secrets are lies, sharing is caring, privacy is theft. Now, I don't think we're quite there yet. I think that uh, these technologies of communication are, are very helpful. We love them. But there's a reason that our culture has devised terms such as oversharing, uh, TMI, too much information. And the phrase that I think captures a particular kind of anxiety of our age, FOMO, fear of missing out. So these things all play into why we want to violate our own privacy. We fear being unconnected. We fear missing out. And we often talk about privacy in this context <coughs> as a trade-off, as if it's some sort of replenishable <coughs> currency that we can continue to deal out to ourselves and to others and that we have control over. I don't think it is. I think when we think about our personal privacy in these terms, we've already lost some of the debate. So let me just throw out there one quick idea, which is about the self. And I think pre-internet technology, we had a sense of the self, certainly in the 20th century, as a private, inviolable thing. It developed over time. Our quirks, our passions, our sympathies all had time and privacy to develop. We could test them out with each other and in small groups. Now we test that out publicly. And um, what I want to challenge us to think about today is whether we're moving towards an idea of self that is more transparent, but that also leads us into being um, a kind of people who are fearful of having an undatabased experience. Thanks, Christine. That's actually a great way of, uh, of thinking about it. And I really like the fact that you've 
helped us focus on the self and kind of working through that. So, um, uh, Andrew, give us your thoughts, please. Oh, um, well, I'm going to add on to Christine. I always agree with everything she says. I like this idea of secrets are lies. That, that's from the Eggers book, which is definitely all of you should read it. I mean, is it out in the UK yet, Circle? If, you, if it is out, you should read it. Um, so the idea of secrets as, as lies, I, I, there's this, um, some of you may have read a book uh, by Max Weber about the Protestant Reformation and uh, uh, the Puritan work ethic, the Protestant work ethic and capitalism. And in that, he argues that um, what happened in, in, um, in the Industrial Revolution were that the monasteries were turned inside out, so that the work ethic of the monastery went into the world, and the world became like a gigantic monastery, which accounts for the Industrial Revolution, the work ethic, and all the rest of it. I think in a peculiar way, something is happening that the world that Christine's talking about, the secrets are lies discourse, uh, a similar thing has happened, but rather than monasteries, the confessional has been turned into the world. In the old days, in the Catholic world, the confessional was a private sphere. It was built on the intimacy of secrets. And now the world has been turned into a giant confessional. And the currency of the world is somehow the values, currency I mean in, a, in an economic sense or in a moral sense, the currency of the world is devolving from that. So the people who are profiting from a world in which secrets are lies, in other words, a world where you're supposed to reveal everything, are the showmen or the show ladies. You, I think you're probably going to say something about this after me. It's people who let everything hang out. So the currencies in this world are of self-revelation. You see it play out in the political sphere. You see it in terms of the, the increasing value of things like authenticity and intimacy. The most successful politicians then in this world are the ones who are able to build authenticity and intimacy and use these new tools, the tools that Christine talked about, to profit themselves, to make careers out of themselves. And of course, in broad economic terms, Secrets are lies. The idea that secrets are lies are benefiting the large Silicon Valley companies because they are the peddlers in this new intimacy. They're the ones who own this vast global confessional. They're the ones who are trading in our secrets. They're the ones who are monetizing the, everything that we say about ourselves. So in political terms, I think what's interesting and, and, I, and this touches on what Christine was talking about as well, everything becomes personal, or the personal and the political become so mixed up that they're hard to separate. The ultimate consequence of all this, though, and this idea of secrets are lies, I think, is the death of conventional political ideology, the death of the traditional distinction between left and right. In the Eggers book, for example, which is a dystopian take on what Silicon Valley is doing to the world, Politicians walk around with cameras. They are perpetually self-broadcasting themselves. So in political terms, the consequence of this is that people are valued not in terms of what they're saying, but in terms of their potential secrets. And I think Frank is, I hope Frank will say something about authority in this world, because it's a new kind of authority. It's a moral authority. The traditional authority of the expert of the political party is being undermined by the authority of the authentic, the authority of self-revelation, the authority of the confessional. So the public takes it for granted that politicians are corrupt. And the only way in which politicians can prove they're not is by walking around with their cameras. The casualty of this, of course, is serious political discourse. The casualty is that everything gets reduced to the individual and everything gets reduced to the personal. So this panel asked, today that private space is increasingly subject to public scrutiny. But actually, that's wrong. The world we're living in today is one in which public life is subject to private scrutiny. So the tyranny today is not of 1984 or the traditional tyrannies of the 20th century. The tyranny today is of the personal, of the private, of the confessional. And we need, as with all tyrannies, to throw this off 
And maybe that's one of the things we can talk about today, how we get rid of this kind of tyranny. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. And moving on from thoughts on the confessional to more thoughts on the confessional. Uh, Sheila. Um, so I'm going to present some ideas around the subject through personal experience. Um, my, my take on privacy is that it's generally uh, an overrated concept. Um, I, I agree with a, a lot of what Christine said, although I think I, I disagree that, that we're innately private animals. I, I, I'm not sure about this. For thousands of years, we lived in very open communities, and even now people hark back to, nostalgically to a recent past where people's front doors were left open and we walked freely in and out of our neighbours' houses, and, and people think that, that, that was, you know, those were good times. So I think privacy is quite a modern concept, and I think it has developed through the sort of rise of, of capitalism, because through capitalism we've created wealth and possessions, and in order to protect those possessions we've built walls and fences and shutters and, and locks, and we have become private. Now, two days ago, I tried to commit an act of fraud. My, my mum owes me £20,000, and she doesn't have internet, and the fastest way to get the money into my account was uh, via the telephone. Now, she's 78, she's a little bit deaf, uh, she's Spanish, she lives in Spain, so it's expensive to, to call the UK. So she asked me if I would uh, call the bank and pretend to be her. Uh, so I've been imitating my mum most of my life, so I wasn't daunted by this uh, at all. I put on my best. You know, hello, yes, I want to transfer 20th year to my daughter's account. Yes, yes. And I had all the info, I had all the PIN numbers, the security questions, the checks, everything, and I was told that the money would be in my daughter's account the next day. And the next day I looked in, the account, in my account and it wasn't there. So I called up the bank as myself, and, um, and they said that my mum needed, needed to go into the branch or, or, or call them again. So when she called, they told her that they hadn't transferred the money because they were unsure of her identity and could she come into the branch or personally write a letter. Now, I was slightly shitting my pants at this um, information, but I was also impressed and reassured by the systems in place that stopped me from potentially stealing my mum's money, even though it was consensual and she actually owes it to me. But anyway. <laughs> but I was also a little bit freaked out by this. You know, I had all the right information and my impersonation was spot on. And it makes you, it, it, it makes you question, you know, is, is, does, my, does my phone number come up as a red alert? You know, were people listening to our phone conversations when we were hatching this plan? <laughs> So, you know, generally I don't object to surveillance cameras. I have no objection to carrying an identity card if that were imposed on me. I don't really object to security cameras. I choose to believe that they are there to protect us. I'm not even bothered about whether the government can access my Facebook account. Um, but I'm also prepared to accept that I may be over-trusting and naive and that, that maybe there is a more sinister side to surveillance that I'm unaware of. And I would be happy to, happy to hear any arguments in favour of uh, that opinion. Changing the subject, I've also been at the centre of a public-private debate, as uh, Claire said in 2006. I, I, a cabaret act of mine was illegally posted online. Because the act involves full frontal nudity, I was instinctively protective about sending it out into the cyber world, and I had stopped it from, from going online. But as soon as it went online, I was inundated with emails from strangers all over the world. They found my, uh, my email address on my website. That's quite straightforward. They sent me extremely personal, intimate, and inappropriate emails. They entered my personal space, confusing the boundaries between uh, the public persona and the private person. A few years after receiving emails, I decided to make a show here at the Barbican, commissioned by the Barbican, where I presented these unsolicited emails and pictures that the strangers had sent me. So I effectively made public their private messages uh, to me. Um, my intention was not an act of revenge. I, I was also not intending to expose other people's lives, but to make a truthful uh, piece of art about our contemporary world and an exploration into loneliness, sexual obsession, virtual relationships, and the confusions created by living our lives through a mediated forum and, and the internet. Uh, finally, I want to talk about the everyday benefits of public disclosure and uh, self-confession and revelation. 
I've made a career out of conf confessing to an audience. I even implicated my own parents. I made another show that was also performed here at the Barbican, where every night I asked my parents difficult personal questions, and the only rule was that they had to answer truthfully, which could include, I don't want to answer that question. Um, I'm quite open and confessional in my real life. I also draw confession from others by asking questions. I believe that talking openly about ourselves, our foibles, our failures, as well as our successes, makes for a richer, more intelligent, more aware, more tolerant, and more diverse society. Let's take being in the closet as a perfect example. If everyone stayed in the closet for fear of being persecuted, rejected, or whatever their reasons, then we would not have made the progress we have made in terms of gay rights, and I believe our society is richer for that progress. I have never advocated outing people. I'm interested simply in educating them to understand how important it is to come out. I think that there are still a number of social taboos sexual or that people are afraid to talk about. Sexual orientation is still, is still amongst them. Mental illness and depression, um, conflicts at home, HIV, addictions, abuse. I think we just need to talk more open and more, more often. And I'm not talking about the social media. I'm talking about at dinner parties with our friends when we pop round to see our neighbours. I go so far as to believe it's an individual social moral responsibility to be open. Um, the personal is political and self-revelation leads to social revelation, which leads to progress. And on this, I'm unchangeable. Thank you. Uh, uh, perfect and passionate um, uh, counterweight, I think, to some of the things we've heard, but very useful in terms of moving the discussion on. So, David. I was very seduced by your notion of what would make a good Channel 4 programme, uh, Claire, which is essentially, you see the sex, but with the faces pixelated out uh, and with no discussion afterwards, uh, and so on. Um, such things are, I have to tell you, very readily available on today's internet. Um, God, I always thought I was an original thinker, David. Yeah. <laughs> In a way, I have a kind of difficulty, which is that I don't actually have a position uh, in the sense that I don't really recognise the millenarian notion that, uh, in other words, I think Dave Eggers' novel is a clever dystopic fantasy, and like most dystopic fantasies, it will contain an element of truth, and like most dystopic fantasies, it can't be regarded as a prediction. There are a few that, uh, that do, but mostly uh, they don't. I suppose the reason for that is that, in general, in democratic societies in particular, where essentially what we're talking about is a range of human behaviours that, by and large, go beyond policy. In other words, nobody decided that simply by passing a law for easier divorce, so many of us would get divorced. Only we could decide whether or not we wanted to do that, whether we wanted to set up separate households, and so on. So in other words, we're talking about a range of human behaviours in the context of new and developing technologies that go beyond beyond, by and large, a policy that anybody has set for us. It's what we choose to do. And I am suspicious of those lines of argument which essentially suggest that our fellow human beings are stupid and foolish enough to do routinely stupid and foolish things which they do not understand and which end up in terrible malign and possibly even quasi-nuclear consequences for everybody. So, in other words, there is a series of, of ideas within a kind of proposition about where we're going, which I take almost straight away to be exaggerated um, or to be over-pessimistic. Um, the other thing I should say, that as the chair of Index on Censorship, one of the things that's been very interesting to me in the last few months is to watch that organisation have a, have a form of discussion with itself about, if you like, the question of free expression. And Ursula touched upon it because it doesn't often get a look in. Jeff Jarvis is also a writer who talks about this, the conflict between free expression and notions of privacy. And it is important to note that the way in which certain people talk about privacy, let's say in the context of Edward Snowden and the NSA revelations, is certainly not the way that anybody would have understood privacy 50 years ago, and certainly not understood privacy 100 years ago. The concept of privacy, which has actually embodied within it certain 
different concepts, such as is there, a, is there such a thing as a right to solitude, for instance, also has the notion that your public face is that which you choose, you select to make public. Now, of course, there are all kinds of problems with this. Uh, I have here an article from last week's Sunday Times uh, entitled From Here to Paternity. Um, it is the article about Mia Farrow's suggestion that her son, Ronan, who was originally christened Satchel, and being called Satchel is a reminder that there are worse things that can happen to you than an invasion of pri your privacy, um, <laughs> such as having parents who will call you Satchel, uh, and so on, um, was in fact not Woody Allen's uh, son, but Frank Sinatra's son. Now, whose privacy do we consider to have been violated in the construction of this story, and who did the violating. Did Mia Farrow do it? Did Frank Sinatra in some way kind of combine to do it? Did the, jur the journalist who wrote this particular story do it? Or did you do it by deciding that this was a very interesting thing to read and to talk about? Ursula talked about earlier, and she's absolutely right. There are a series of beliefs about past privacy, about past times, which include actually a closeness of living together, which we would regard as being very unprivate. Until the Middle Ages and the, until the Renaissance and so on, I, well, I could take another example. I had to share a bedroom with my brother until I was 15. Am I to consider that my privacy was routinely violated up until the age of 15, but suddenly I was liberated from this violation at the age of 15? Actually, at the time, I'd have said that the answer was certainly yes. Um, and he probably would have said, uh, he would have said exactly the same thing. But of course, we used to live in societies that had to live very much more closely together. People lived all together in one room. If sex was going to happen, then it had to happen unpixelated, uh, but presumably when other people were asleep. The word common I discovered when looking it up, actually means, or derives its root from people who share a room together, often while on the, on the road and so on, because people would have to do that because there was no way in which they would have, in that sense, private space for themselves. And anybody who's been to Pompeii has seen the way in which rich Romans defecated together whilst talking around the sort of large, uh, something which I would consider to be the ultimate invasion of modern privacy. In fact, uh, I have here a fellow Spurs fan down the, uh, down the one of the worst things about going to a football ground, or the Spurs ground at the moment, is that they still have those kind of trough urinals where you can, if you are so minded, look down a complete row of urinating penises and so on, and somebody can look at you. I find these things absolutely horrific. That, those urinals were only built about 20 years ago and so on, and already they don't pass the Aronovich modern privacy test. So... <laughs> All we're saying there is, is that concepts of privacy are relative and mutable and they alter. And therefore, we are also saying that we have a particular series of problems and challenges dealing with how the concepts of privacy alter in the light of new technology. And now I'll come back to the point about index on censorship and then I'll leave it there. The problem for an organisation like Index on Censorship is that we are primarily a freedom of expression organisation. In other words, we want people to be as, feel, as free as they want to feel in expressing themselves, and we think that this absolutely is the foundation of a free society and so on, is the, and including expressing themselves badly, including expressing themselves sometimes offensively, uh, including experimenting with their expression, including writing about themselves, and including quite often writing about others and so on. But Index on Censorship also has a view of the Snowden uh, revelations, which I have to say is actually not particularly the view I hold. I'm the chair of Index on Censorship. I don't necessarily have to go along with all of it, which is that there is per se a threat to privacy by knowing that possibly somebody who you didn't authorise to could at some stage look at things that you have put down that you thought were private and that that could have a chilling effect upon your freedom of expression or your expression. Now, I think that this is an argument certainly well worth taking seriously, but it shows you how complicated the argument about the interrelationship between free expression and privacy has become. I have to say, by and large, and general, and this is where, where I will leave it, that in the discussion of the tension between privacy 
as we now understand it to be, and free expression, like Ursula in the end, but maybe not quite so extremely, and withholding rather more of myself uh, from public view, I tend to come down on the side of freedom of expression. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think you draw out quite a lot of the tensions that I have with this as well, kind of no, or, or rather I, I, I shift between where I think the, the balance is. But anyway, um, so that was very useful, David. Thank you. So, Frank, just kind of finish off this formal part, please, your thoughts. Thank you. Uh, I actually think that uh, freedom and privacy are mutually reinforced in concept, and that privacy is logically prior, both historically and logically prior to freedom and the exercise of freedom, rather than being antithetical. If you go back to the Greeks, Pericles' fam famous speech, you will find that it was always seen as having a, an existentially fundamental role to play. And it seems to me that what we're suffering from in this discussion is a confusion to do with history, because although privacy is experienced relatively, there are certain absolute fundamental themes that are central to it as an ex ex existential need for our humanity and for our capacity to uh, be free individuals. And I think what has happened is that because of the historical amnesia of our time, we, we lose sight of the concept that we use. For example, everybody in this panel, I would imagine myself included, occasionally talk about the confessional. It's actually a historically inappropriate term because there is nothing more private than a confessional is. If you know anything about Catholic liturgy, it's an extremely intimate relationship that you develop with God through the medium of somebody else. And the duty of the priest is to kind of very seriously police the confidence that you've kind of expressed there. I think it's a sign of the times that we can't even retain the confessional in its proper historical sense by the fact that in places like Australia and elsewhere, there are Catholic churches that have transparent confessional booths because we're worried about the priest you know, abusing that particular kind of right. And, and the fact is, is that the, we can't even hold on to something fundamental as that. I think that the problem that we face is a cultural one, and it's not a technological one. I think that uh, a long time before the internet, cultural pressures have been created which pathologize privacy. And there's already in important discussions in the United States, David Reisman's Lonely Crowd, discussions on Candid Camera, which happened a very long time in the 50s, which already indicate that if we go down this road, we are going to lose our sense of self and can only realize it as a public performance. So there's already that stuff that's kind of coming out. And I think what the tragedy is that people, when they talk about privacy these days, are always conscious of the old forms of the attack on it. You know, the police keeping an eye on us, identity cards, you know, sort of the NSA spying on us. And I think that's the most trivial aspect. That's, you know, that's nothing new about it. And, and usually it's kind of overplayed quite a bit. Well, what we're very scared to address directly is that we're so uncomfortable with the private sphere that we increasingly have changed our language. So the word secret now is the worst thing you can, you, you can't have a secret with a child because that's a marker of being an abuse. You can't have a family secret because, you know, why are you hiding something? But of course, you know, if you know human history, you know that we all have our secrets. I mean, we, our psychological needs for secrets is really quite important and we're all entitled to have our secrets because that's the way we make our way and that's the way we you know, sort of learn to live with the world and the pressures that are kind of, kind of bear upon us. But I think what's very sad to me is that uh, when you look at the way that the private sphere is talked about, it becomes a site of abuse, it becomes a site of domestic violence. And whereas everybody in this room would say that when a policeman says, you know, what's wrong, you know why are you worried about an identity card? If you've got nothing to hide, you know, sort of, you know, what are you worried about if you're innocent? We all know what to say. We all say, well, actually, it's none of your business you know, as to whether I'm innocent or not. That's my right as a citizen. But when somebody comes along and says that we need to check what's going on in your family in the name of the child, you know, sort of, you know, and if you've got nothing to hide, you know, if you're a good mother and father, then you know, what are you worried about? Then everybody caves in and rolls over. And I thought it was very, very interesting that in this country, people criticize the anti-terrorism laws and the surveillance of individuals on, underneath that. But when the CBR checks were kind of introduced on adults being with children, everybody thought it was really cool. You know, I mean, having you know, sort of 15 million people in a police database who come near children, that's perfectly all right because children are involved. So what I'm trying to suggest is that the minute you uh, sort of emphasize the intimate aspects of our life, you know, personal relationships between man and woman, husband and wife, children and adults, then it's really cool to colonize the private space of people 
because that's actually you know, a good thing. At that point, the, the private sphere becomes seen as being an entirely hostile environment with very little redeeming features. And uh, you might say, well, that actually means we, we worship the public sphere. But of course, we, are, we know from human history that the quality of public life is 120% dependent on our capacity to be private individuals. You know, we go out into the public domain and we engage with one another because in, in our private sphere, we are allowed to reflect upon ourselves. We can be who we are. We can relax a little bit. We can take the mask off you know, for, for a little while and we can, we can get back there and be proper public citizens. But in the absence of that, what has happened in this country, and Britain is probably one of the more extreme cases, and I don't want to say I'm millenarian, but when I hear, for example, last week, the head of Ofsted saying that uh, the problem of education in Britain is, is bad parenting, and that actually it's what happens in the private sphere that is responsible for a public problem, you do realize there's been a massive shift in the way that we view our world. So whereas in, ever since the Enlightenment, we more or less saw social problems as what they really were, you know, sort of problems to do with the public sphere, the way that the economic social life was organized and distributed. We now increasingly blame the private sphere, what happens within the, the domain of the private, as the cause of virtually every single social distress. So education, craft parents, child obesity, craft parents, you know, sort of drug addiction, self-harming, virtually every problem that exists in the public domain, you have a causal dynamic that brings it back to what happens within our intimate life. That's really what it, you know, you know, you know where we gotta go. And as David, as David Cameron, our prime minister said in this country, you know, we got a 200,000 horrible families and they're responsible for just about everything that is corrosive you know, within our society. So what I'm trying to say is that you destroy the, the private, the culture of privacy, which is what we've done, and you implode the public because you, you no longer see problems in, in the public domain as susceptible to public solutions. You see all the solutions as, as kind of getting, basically saving children from their parents, basically saving women from their husbands or husbands from their, from, from their wives, and you do end up in a, in, in a world where we do become caricatures ourselves. Just one final point. Privacy has nothing to do with the geographical distinction. I mean, you, know, you had in the old days people coming in and out of their houses in medieval times, very fundamental existential distinction, boundary between our, you know, who we were as private people and the public. You can have you know, millions of people you know, sort of hanging around you, but you still know that there needs to be an area where you can take your mask off, where you can be yourself, where you can, in a sense, experiment with life in ways that you cannot do when you have a mass audience asking you, putting the, shoving the mic in front of your face and saying, Frank, how does it feel? Very briefly, just to try and pull things together and do feel free to just respond to what each other said when I, so you can ignore what I'm going to ask you when you're coming back up. Trying to pull something that Frank and David and Christine said all together, if you know what I mean. So um, that point about taking the mask off, I, w I was really struck, David, when you were saying about the tensions on the free speech thing, because one of the things, never mind in the private sphere, but there's also the sense in, um, if you take an issue like transparency of every organisation, or even the kind of, um, the, the way that we kind of get, uh, give a tick to people who leak these days or, 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 and so on and so forth, that there's all these secrets behind closed doors. One of my fears is that, that we are taking away um, this place in, in institutions where you can speak off record and where, in a way, you can take your mask off and where you can actually think aloud and say the unsayable. And in a way, that's a kind of... You know, the freedom, in, that's a private sphere. Yeah, go on. Well, embodied within that is a proposition. And I only accept it to a certain extent. And that is the idea that what is secret and what is private is truer than what is public and what's out front. Actually, we have no reason to think that. And actually, we have quite a lot of reason to think the opposite. So if we think sometimes about the function of the confessional, for instance, uh, and incidentally, the way in which it was put uh, earlier, it made it sound like a new form of sex box, didn't it, really? I mean, it's actually, the Australian ones are now made uh, transparent. I was thinking, incidentally, one of the answers to one of our recent problems is, to, is for somebody to invent the transparent niqab. Uh, and so on, capsule covers everything, but you, but you can see through it. Uh, We've got a session on that tomorrow. I must put it forward. <laughs> 
sides of a bag. <laughs> uh, 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 on the NICAP. So I wonder, really, to the extent to which it is actually true that secrecy is good for us. I don't mean that it's always bad for us. So Ursula posits, if you like, the, and was brave to do so, the complete opposite, which is always bad for us. Actually, of course, it's very ambivalent. I think we can be very ambiguous about secrecy and about the need for it. But the idea that somehow... Our, it's, it's like the idea that our true selves are embodied by what we order on Amazon. I've seen this proposition a large number of times. They know what you're thinking if they know what you've Googled. No, you don't. You have no idea what I'm thinking because you know what I've Googled or what I've ordered from Amazon, etc. All you know from what I've ordered from Amazon is what I've ordered from Amazon, and that's about, and that's about it. So consequently, I think I start, like Ursula, from a position of considerably less worry about the notion of less secrecy. Now, you could argue, and I'll, I'll, I'll give up because I want, I want other people, to, obviously, to come in, about what the function of transparency actually is. Do you automatically get greater tr trust as a result of greater transparency? It doesn't seem so, so far, but maybe you will. Is it what I regard as almost, and this is a very bad, this is bad, it's impolite in a way to say it this way, but I regard the call for trade transparency as almost inevitable. It's a function of, partially, of the fact that we have the ability technologically to see things that we didn't before, and we are a questing species. Christine, um, what about that sort of notion that historically there was much more clarity, I mean, regardless of what views of self are, but just historically, politically, it was understood that there was a private sphere that was distinct from a public sphere, regardless of what you thought about what was happening in that private sphere or not. Um, do, you know, is the concentration on the self making it too micro and kind of missing the points where? Um, maybe a little bit, but I will say, um, I'm glad Frank brought up Riesman. There's also a, a great American sociologist, Irvin Goffman, who had a conception of the backstage. And this, this, was, this was a discussion that you could, have about, you could have about institutions, but he had it about the individual, which is that everybody needs a place backstage where they are free to express themselves. It actually is an argument for a kind of freedom of expression, but it's not the way we're discussing it now. But it, he felt that this was central to the creation of a, of a sense of self, but you could make a similar argument for institutions institutions, that there needs to be freedom. Look, I'll give you an example from one of the most dysfunctional <coughs> institutions of recent memory, the United States Congress, which I was very glad they finally sort of got their act together before I came here, because I was, I was uh, hesitant to talk about them. But transparency arguments were made um, about uh, five or 10 years ago. Let's give every congressman email address, and then their constituents will have this amazing access to congressmen. You know, they don't have to go through their aides. They just contact them directly, and then, you know, this is democracy in action. Well, it's now harder to reach your congressman than it was before email, in part because congressmen were inundated with email, and so now everyone's on Twitter, and they, they do these Twitter buzz. So, I mean, I think that it's very, we, we come up with technological solutions to existential problems, and we do that at the institutional level, and we're doing it as individuals to the, to the problem that Frank was, was articulating um, in his comments, that there is this existential challenge. I mean, what Pascal said, this is the greatest problem mankind faces. He can't sit alone by himself with his own thoughts in an empty room, right? I mean, this is a huge human challenge. As to the, the freedom aspect of it and the freedom of expression, look, 70 to 80 percent of all internet traffic in the world goes at some point is routed through the United States and through the tech servers of these large companies. That is a, not the kind of freedom of expression that I think we're talking about here. There is an infrastructure in place that makes a lot of these discussions moot if we start looking at who owns the information. So I think we can talk about it at the individual level and the choices we make, but there's a bigger institutional crisis here, and those companies lack transparency if we're talking about it at that level. Uh, what do you think, Ursula, about the kind of notion of the demonization, that there's a danger of what of, of the kind of converse of what you're saying, which is to demonize those people who want to have private lives that they keep to themselves. I mean, you were saying, you use the, uh, appropriately, they're in the closet and that you were going to out people. But, you know, the, the kind of space for, for me to say, mind your own business, got nothing to do with you, what... what no, absolutely, yeah, no, no. and you're absolutely entitled to, to, that, uh, to that opinion, and it's simply my job to try and change your opinion so that you do talk more openly about yourself and about your sex life and the box and all of that. You'll all be glad to know. <laughs> it's not going to happen any time soon, guys. Don't worry. Marks is so, so, absolutely. No, I, uh, so, you know, that, that is, you know, the perfect metaphor. I don't believe in outing people, but it's just simply my job to kind of encourage them. <laughs> um, uh, Andrew and, uh, and Frank, I mean... You had your kind of confessional difference, but were you actually arguing anything differently? I mean, Andrew, did you recognise 
Because I thought it was interesting, actually, because I presume that you were kind of slightly referring to David Aronovich's point, Frank, about the geographical space. But, Andrew, did you recognise that? Or do you... That, that it's not so... It doesn't matter whether you can... are all living together, but there was a sense of privacy historically. Is that true, or is Frank been romantic, or...? Frank, romantic. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it was being romantic about the Catholic confessions and how we can't, you know, we can't even, you know, speak about confession in that traditional Catholic way of private. It's like, yeah, well, my, who cares about that? Let's have a different form of confession, and that confession was always implied guilt. My confession is a sort of confession of sort of innocence and kind of. Well, yeah, I mean that was my point. That it, it's it's. It reverses the confession. I'm not suggesting that, that literally the world has become a confessional. I'm saying that the whole thing is turned on its head. I'm very critical of the nostalgists, the people who idealize history and always make this argument, oh, well, before the industrial age, we all lived in villages and we all wandered into each other's homes and we were half-dressed or undressed and we sat on the toilet together and we were very happy. <laughs> I, I just think this is, uh, you know, it's like you might as well go on and say, well, um, you know, 500 years ago there was torture, there was perpetual warfare and religious persecution and all the rest of it, so let's just go back to those things too. I, I think one of the achievements of modernity is the carving out of the private from the public, is the mythologization, if there's such a word, or the, the doing away of the mythology of the state and of the dominant political institutions to carve out independence for individuals. And the idea, Mark Zuckerberg in Facebook said he wanted to create a world which was a giant, well-lit uh, dorm room. Because in the eyes of these people, we have nothing to hide. Eric Schmidt also said it. Uh, well, wh why, why do you care if, if we see everything you do? You shouldn't be, if, if, if you're embarrassed by something, just don't do it. Uh, and I think Dave is also wrong about some somehow conflating Amazon, what you buy on Amazon, and what you do on Google. I mean, the reality is he, he's right about Amazon. I mean, the fact that you know what books you're buying or not buying it probably is not that relevant unless you're an author and you want to force people to buy your own books. But when it comes to Google, there is a fundamental threat. Google is joining the dots. Google isn't just a search engine. Google is a, a social network. Google owns the dominant video platform. Google is the dominant advertiser on the web. And as it joins those dots, Eric Schmidt again said, when he was asked by somebody at the FT where he wanted Google to be in five years, he said, I want to know people better than they know themselves. Not because he's big brother, but because he wants to sell advertising around us and turn us into products. So I am fearful of companies like Google. I think it is a real threat. It's not something that's easy to dismiss. Frank. Just, just to make a, a kind of a, a conceptual distinction, in, uh, because we're kind of using terms maybe a bit loosely. Uh, conceptually, there's a distinction between the private and the intimate. I mean, the way you've got to think about it is that the private, uh, you are a private person in your capacity still as a citizen. It has a certain universal dimension to it, whereas intimacy is an individual accomplishment to do with individual interaction, and where the forms of regulations ought not apply. I think you can regulate dimensions of uh, your, your role as a private citizen. For example, we, we regulate private property, but we leave intimacy alone. That's one of the unstated conventions that has emerged through modernity. And the reason why I'm interested in history isn't to be nostalgic, but because I'm fascinated by the way certain trends get crystallized over the years, certain developments kind of begin to occur. And it seems to me that one of the really important ones where there's been an, an incredible uh, ambivalent but powerful dynamic is, is the sphere of intimacy, which is something that most of us strive for. I mean, we all you know, get up in the morning and we all want to be loved. We all want to have special relationships. I know it sounds, you know, wholly unrealistic, you know, I've never had one in my life, but, you know, it, it doesn't stop me from craving that kind of, you know, kind of, kind of closeness. And one of the reasons why we want it, because we need, you know, we feel the need to both be affirmed, but also to have that kind of, uh, kind of quality, that kind of uh, closeness in the way that we interact that is very rarely available to us in most of our lives. And this is where secrets really kick in. So when I said secrets are important, I didn't mean that you know, I'm a mass murderer and I got my secrets. What I meant is that there is a relationship involved in the intimate, which is 
it's the only time you feel the capacity to self-disclose to another person. You say to that person things that you would never dare say to anybody else. It's a very dangerous thing to do because in the, in the very act of self-disclosure, you court betrayal. You, you kind of, you know, you risk being betrayed by somebody else. Now, my point is very simple, is that as we pathologize the uh, private sphere, we also seek to undermine intimacy. And one of the ways you can see that that's going on is if you go to the United States and you go into any bookshops in America and you go to the self-help section, you'll find there are millions of books on women who love too much, you know, women who love their cats too much. I mean, it's all about codependency and the danger of just being a little bit too close. And I think it's that cultural pressure point that ultimately explains the whole unraveling of the cultural affirmation for privacy. It's, it's, it's our, our, our disorientation and our estrangement from being that, taking that risk with that other person. And, 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 uh, and it's our longing for... Very quick, very quick, because I want to go out. Yeah. It's our longing for... Um, it's a bizarre world where we long for two things more than anything else, intimacy and trust, in a world where... By doing that, we're destroying both intimacy and trust, which explains the crisis in trust politically, I think. Thank you, particularly towards the end of that debate, because it started to make some clarity for me. And the thing that I'd like to say is, and I'm going to quote somebody whose husband died, and she said to me, I have lost what it is to be known. And that was about something about though those things that Frank Freud talked about, about intimacy, trust, the things that you can dare to say and to be, in a place where you know that is not going to be betrayed. And I think the distinction between that sort of relationship and the way that we give away those things in the ways that uh, the new uh, media allow us to do is a, sl is a very slow and sneaky thing that's happening. And I'm, I'm frightened, particularly for young people who don't realize that the experiments that they should be doing about the announcements that they make about themselves are so public and also indestructible. I may have to sympathize um, greatly with David Aronovich about this situation at Spurs at White Hart Lane. I thought Spurs were trying to stamp out racism in sport and now we're here they're in inspecting people's penises in the, in the laboratories. <laughs> Not for that reason, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought that Ursula, I thought that Ursula put her finger on it um, wrongly. <laughs> <laughs> for God's <laughs> sake. <laughs> so you have seen the video. Chapter two, Excuse chapter me, two. this is the Institute two. of Ideas. I do not want to lower the tone. <laughs> I thought you put your finger on it uh, wrongly when, when you said that uh, you didn't uh, care about identity cards and you wouldn't object, you said, if they were imposed. And that's the point. You know, it's all right for you not to object about identity cards. Say, hey, if, you know, if you, people ha want to have something to prove who they are, and you want that, <coughs> fine for you. And what it misses, I think, is the crucial aspect of this, which is control. You know, somebody else can choose not to have an identity card if they don't want one. And so you're happy for it to be imposed on you, but they'll be imposed on everybody. Oh, and no, so what, so what, so what, I'm happy listen, for it to this be is the important thing, you know, this is the important thing, we're talking about some individual control over that boundary between the private and the public. And, you know, it's about a space and, you know, however we define that space within which people have the opportunity themselves freely, you know, to explore and experiment and so on and to express themselves. But most importantly of all, to say where the boundary between that space is for themselves. I mean, I do worry, especially when the chair of the, uh, the Index on Censorship organisation says, you know, that there's a supposition that all that's good in the, all that's in the private sphere is good. You know, do I hear an implication there that, you know, somebody outside the private sphere knows what is good and true and should have the ability to go into the private sphere to find out what it is. Oh. Now, that's, this is, but this is what is an issue. This is what is an issue. It's about the element. People can say, you know, it isn't anybody's business whether there is something wrong or wicked or, or what somebody is thinking or saying or doing in private. This is the point. So the idea that, you know, if there was a supposition uh, that everything is good, that would be fine. It's, a, it's the point about people being able to say, you know, for me, I want this space, and that element of control is being eroded in a myriad of ways, many of which have been talked about here. 
I must say that this motion that privacy is lies, I totally disagree with it. And I, quite frankly, find it very um, disturbing and scary. Um, just because something's private doesn't mean it's a lie. Um, and the only way that we can have total control over our lives is through this privacy. We need to be open to ideas and society's problems, but there isn't any need to reveal our most intimate thoughts and our feelings. And that those who um, do choose to do so are either very brave or are idiots. Because if they are, well, because whatever you are, you are ignoring the fact that there, are, that there can be severe repercussions to actually opening your mind to the world. And you're um, opening yourself very much to um, a lot of attack, I suppose is the best way to put it. If people are afraid of revealing their feelings because of this backlash from society, we should talk about these um, problems that create this backlash, not pressuring them to be open um, when they don't want to be. It was useful to hear discussion of the difference, the relationship between privacy and intimacy. Um, I'm interested in uh, whether there's a meaningful distinction between privacy and secrecy. Um, in British Sign Language, the sign for uh, private and the sign for secret are the same. Mm -hmm. You move your hand in front of your face like that, like a door opening or closing, or a veil opening or closing, although you mouth the words differently. Um, it seems to me one important distinction between them is that private is a less pejorative word than secret, and that the, the conflation of the two is itself a form of attack on the idea of privacy, in as much as if someone asks you a question and you respond that's private, to a certain way of thinking, and it's one I subscribe to, for most intents and purposes, that is sufficient. That stops the conversation, certainly at an individual level, and, and to a large extent at an institutional level as well. But the assumption that privacy and secrecy are interchangeable assumes that that's not a sufficient sign. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting that that conflation is taking place. The most common name now for domestic violence um, projects is behind closed doors. And they often start off, I mean, it's kind of like being recommended as if you're setting up an NGO, it says behind closed doors. And it often starts off saying, what are the secrets that go on when the door closes? And you think, I don't know, you're having a fish and chips and you're with your family. <laughs> but I mean, I, you know, it's like sort of like, no, but it, but it is interesting that, I mean, obviously domestic violence is horrific, but that it just is associated with closing the door of a family home where you have secrets and domestic violence all conflated into one. Obviously, it is something weird happening there. I just wanted to pick up on something David said almost in passing about transparency and trust, because this is something that comes up a lot, the idea that you actually increase trust through greater transparency, mainly on the institutional level, but there is obviously also this implication kind of in, in people's private lives. And, and I do think it's a, it's a very strong drive. I hear it in all sorts of contexts like, oh, well, you know, we have all this data about organisations and they will open up their data and so we'll trust them more. And it, my feeling is it's fundamentally misguided because actually trusting means that you don't want to know everything somebody's doing. You, you don't want to know every time your partner has a thought. You certainly don't want to know everything they think. You trust them to not do something you wouldn't want them to do. And on an institutional level, can it really increase trust if, if we demand to know everything that is going on? Is that not a sign that there is no trust? What David Aronovich said um, at one, one point was no, there's no policy for openness. It's what people choose to do, which is absolutely right. But on the other hand, this implied that there was no consequences to what people did. In other words, you could argue that people choose to eat certain things, and the result of eating those are obesity, ill health, which have personal and social consequences. But tying up this business of openness, of which uh, the social uh, media um, are a good example, I think Frank also mentioned an important point, and that was, he says, the trouble is people lose a sense of self, and what they do becomes a public performance. And I think this is one of the consequences of this world, where people have no, are, are gradually having no sense of who they are, of their self-worth, without having to make a public performance and tell everyone about it. And if the world became what Ursula seems to be suggesting, I think it would be one of the most boring things we've ever got, that essentially everyone is telling you everything about yourself. And it reminds me of someone who went to America on a plane and sat next to an American, and within two seconds, chap was telling me he's got varicose veins, he's got a peptic ulcer, <laughs> and he's divorced, and he never sees his children. 
And what she actually wanted to do is read a book. So this is, I mean, this is proliferating and it is becoming a problem. But I think the most important, for, particularly for young people, is a, is a lack of knowing what your self-worth is, who you are, unless you can tell everyone what you're doing. Okay, Ursula. I'm, I'm not advocating boring conversations with strangers on aeroplanes. I'm just simply advocating let's not shy away from the social taboos that hold our society back and move us forward, you know, as human beings, which is a very different thing. I, I'm not going to defend the talkative American. It's, it's a stereotype for a reason. Um, something that uh, you mentioned about transparency, and I, I think a lot of the conversation about transparency ends up being about trying to control risk, whether that's at the institutional level or even at the personal level. And I, I know more about the, institution, uh, the, the personal uh, technologies, which is what I study. And there's an interesting group at MIT which is creating these sociometers. And these are wearable sensors. And it will do exactly what you feared, which is you wear one and your significant other wears one. And they measure you know, galvanic skin response, heart rate, blood pressure. So you would know that every time your husband walked in the door, your blood pressure spikes. And that's information probably neither one of you wants to get too much into finding out why. So the, the thing is that there is a logic to these technologies. And the logic, certainly, of the technology, the technologists and the software developers is if we can do it, we should. And it seems a lot of what we're circling around in conversation here is the question of should we? And I think that's the conversation that certainly isn't happening in Silicon Valley enough. Um, and it's nice to hear some of that happening today. I, I think it's also interesting to think of this in terms of the kind of crisis of the state and of the definancing of health systems. Because what you're seeing, I think, is an alternative system coming into place, an alternative society in which we're increasingly defined around our data and what we do or don't publish. And in the healthcare era, I think it's particularly relevant. Um, you're going to see the emergence of healthcare companies that will determine our value and our health rates according to the kind of devices we wear and how much we eat and how much we smoke and how much we drink. You're going to see the same in, in education. So I think as this new world comes into being, the issue of the distinction between the public and the private and the amount of data about ourselves that is known becomes increasingly political. It sort of it leaves the cultural sphere of whether or not people know we're gay and becomes, I think, much more bound up in, in how we support ourselves, um, whether we get health care, how we're educated, how we're valued, how we're employed. So I think this is a really central issue in the digitalized 21st century. It's not, uh, it's not something that we can look back historically and say, well, things were better back then or something like that. We're, le we're, we're entering an entirely new world where we're evaluated as individuals on our public data. And so I think there's going to need to be laws, legislation, and most of all, I think we need to control these private data companies because I think they're incredibly assertive. In some ways, they're more powerful and wealthier than governments, and um, okay. I, they're, they're exploitative. Yeah. I'm, I'm less critical of access to public data that is used uh, to protect a country or a society, a nation, whatever, such as um, identity cards, which I wasn't advocating that they would simply be imposed on me. I was saying I wouldn't mind if they were introduced. I am very critical of access to public data that is used for capitalist gain, just for selling products. I find that quite offensive. Frank. Well, I don't, because unlike Ursula, my problem is when I called my bank to get money out of my account, they don't accept the fact that I'm Frank Ferrady, and it, <laughs> what you should be a two-minute transaction turns into a, a year-long struggle. Um, <laughs> I just want to say something about secrecy, because um, if you look at the, his, the history of the, of, the, of the word, the way its meaning has changed, it's very, very interesting, because historically, secrecy was pathologized, first of all, by religious organizations, because secrecy was associated with heresy, and uh, various heretics were kind of seen as being having these secrets in the way they, the religions that they kind of practiced. And then later on, uh, secrecy became a, a political tool with which to pathologize radical movements, you know, secret organizations, secret societies of various sorts. And that, that has continued until this day. The interesting thing about secrecy today is that secrecy uh, and its pathologization has shifted from the state to the you know, individual to an interpersonal one. 
And it's really about the policing of interpersonal relationships much more than to do with you know, sort of being resistant to big institutions. And therefore, you know, if you read, if you, if you watch popular culture and you see the word secret being enunciated, it's our secret. And you immediately know, and the signal comes up, when you say it's our little secret, you usually have a man going up to a child late at night and saying, oh, let this be our secret. And you just know straight away that this is a marker for some horrific violation, degradation of that individual. So the word has changed quite fundamental, and it's now really a, a word used to open up the door to the intimate space, and that's, that's, it's a very important shift that has occurred, and I think people should read about, uh, there's some interesting literature on secrecy, um, sort of by, by a sociologist called Simmel, a German sociologist, mm -hmm. which, which is really well worth reading, because it gives us a perspective on just how much our culture has changed in relation to that. By the way, I never said secrecy is lies, or certainly didn't say privacy is lies. That actually came from uh, the dystopic uh, fantasy. What I said was that the presumption that if you find out something that somebody has said they don't want you to hear, or that somebody else doesn't want you to hear, that that is because what they've said is true, I'm afraid that presumption is not necessarily the case. And actually, there is actually, uh, at work here a kind of psychological assumption which is very interesting to me. This is, this is the week in which the health secretary said that they talked about how much loneliness there was out there in society. The actual <laughs> obliterating reality for most people, after all, is not that everybody is listening to what they say, it's that no one is listening to what they say. Uh, and that nobody cares what they say. And in fact, that point was very adequately made by the chap talking about the uh, American person on the plane. All you meant to say was, you don't care what this bloke had. You don't care about him and you don't want to know about him. Uh, you made the presumption, actually correctly in this, that we wanted to hear you say that about the man on the plane and so on. And actually in this situation, it was a fair assumption. In many other assumptions, I can imagine you phoning up to any answers to say that. And everybody thinking, oh, bloody hell. I mean, or, you know, or, or me doing it or whatever. The presumption that we are all being listened to because we are of interest to everybody, unfortunately, in modern society, is almost diametrically the opposite of the truth. And what you often see in what adolescents are trying to do when they express themselves is, if you like, what the robin does when it sings. It simply says, hello, I'm here. Look at me, I'm here. Don't just kind of knock over me. I'm not like every, absolutely everybody. I have my own personal qualities, etc., and I would like them a little bit to be recognised. Now, that, of course, is separate from the question of whether or not Google has too much power. I'm all in favour of the regulation of over-mighty capitalist uh, 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 companies, and I'm also in favour of significant oversight for what the state is able to do to the citizens in, uh, and with the citizens in their names. I'm I'm not against the state doing it necessarily, but I am in favour of adequate oversight while they're doing it. But the presumption that the big problem for us is that continuously um, we people will are trying to get into our private space and understand us, and this is a, a replacement for intimacy. Going back to what the lady said there at, right at the beginning and so on, uh, she was worried about the young people today because they were giving up everything that she thought rightly belonged to the sphere of int intimacy. But I thought what was interesting what you said was, it's not that you are prepared to tell this other person everything that you're thinking. The question is whether they're prepared to listen. And by and large, most of the stuff that goes into the internet, etc., that gets the expression, the problem with it is, like most of the things we do, is that actually the terrible truth is Big Brother isn't watching. I just want to sort of build on what Andrew said and also what the, the lady in the middle said. Uh, I want to talk about Facebook. I really do not like Facebook. And I think the presumption that, you know, we have a choice in what we share, I think is a bit flawed because Facebook is designed to extract data from us, and it's the same for Twitter and Instagram, and all the rest of them. They're there to data. extract data, and they use Skinner Box psychology to do it. And I think uh, you need to really think about what that means, because uh, they're doing it to make money. That, that's why these organizations exist. It's not so uh, we can share things to each other, it's so these companies can make money. And you know, you're talking about our most private thoughts and our most private assertions and who we are are being assigned a value and sold and bought by big companies. And I think, is there anything more dehumanizing? Is there anything more devaluing than 
your, what makes you being given a, you know, a monetary value? From my point of view, it's not big companies that I, as, as one of the internet generation, am worried about. It's, it's bizarrely govern governments that I'm worried about. And I know that sounds very tinfoil hat, but over the summer there were people in Britain convicted for things they posted on Twitter in jest. In America, there are two minors currently in prison, not awaiting trial <coughs> on terrorism charges because both of them, in jest, albeit very um, inappropriately, made jokes about the elementary school shooting in an online video game. And these people are, in, in my opinion, being uh, prosecuted for things that they're effectively, albeit in a public medium, saying in private. And I'm fine with giving up my privacy, but in return, I'd like something back that prevents me being convicted for something I may say while I'm drunk, or I may say while I'm angry at my boss. And I honestly don't think that at the moment there's anything in place to do that. So until a government turns around and says, we won't convict anyone for a thought crime, could we please hang on to privacy a bit longer? I imagine I'm about to get into trouble with the police in Dundee because I've just criticised their obsessive policing of uh, domestic violence. And I'd be interested to know what the panel think about Frank's points here, about what he's emphasising. And I'll, I'll give you an example of what's just happened in uh, Scotland. They've just launched this scheme called Best Bar None, and the Chief Police Officer of Scotland, Sir Stephen House, who's cut his teeth on making domestic violence an issue, explained it like this. He said, you have a scenario where girls are drinking in a bar and have probably drunk too much, and a man comes in and isolates one of them and starts buying her drinks. Before you know it, he's put his arm around her. The friends think they might know this stranger, and before you know it again, he's ushered her away in a taxi. This is a stranger. Women wouldn't get into a car with a strange man during the day, but they do when they're drunk. This is the vulnerability, he said. And the scheme is training bouncers to ask women who come out of nightclubs with a guy if they're sure they actually want to go home <laughs> with this guy. I'd like to know what you think about that. One of the few ways in which people realise there's a problem with invasion of privacy is when they say, um, I don't want to have my data. Which I think is very interesting, that the fact that the whole notion, that the idea of a boundary being breached is, is conceived of purely in the terms of for, form of data, which essentially is an abstracted form. Exactly. It's a person as numbers. It's also the person who, in a totally passive form. Um, so essentially you, you conceive of that as, as bureaucratic, in the terms of bureaucratic authority, not in the meaningful terms of, of me... Um, my life, my self-reflection, my intimacy, uh, in terms of actual, actual social content and, and also your, the things you do, it's in that kind of abstractive, passive form, um, which I think is part of the problem, really shows the limitations in terms of conceiving of this. I don't really understand why people uh, don't need privacy. I don't why, understand why it doesn't assert itself as an existential need. I mean, I think uh, I would have to check in the fun, into the funny farm without, um, without that sphere where you can... Write, write notes and have closeness and all those sorts of things. And I, I, I think that there is a kind of... Um, how do people live in, in that terrain of, of, of responsiveness and Facebook where everything um, is, is visible and where you exist purely on that plane? So, uh, you know, are there implications for, for intellectual work, um, for, for relationships in, in the years to come? You know, what, what hope for origin, originality if people don't keep diaries or write letters but, you know, um, uh, but, but, but kind of post everything on, on blogs? Uh, just one, one thing to think about in terms of like, the different spheres is just even how we speak. I'm, as it were, not, not as interested in my private life as I'm in my... You know, I, I kind of value what people do in the public sphere, not just me, but, you know, I want politicians to do... I don't care what their private lives are, I care what their politics are, I don't, and so on and so forth. But it, but, so it's not to kind of make a kind of big thing about the most important thing about you is your private life. But think about if we all spoke in private as though we were being overheard. That's the thing that I don't like, the, the kind of notion that you can't have a, a place of experimentation. That's why I was asking you about the transparency thing, because there's nothing worse now than people who kind of like go to meetings and behave as though what they're saying might be leaked. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like sort of like automatons. And everyone becomes risk averse because they're frightened to say something like, 
lively. You know, you try and say the unsayable or the unthinkable, even just amongst a group to see what it sounds like, because you constantly think, will this get out? But that does have a counterpoint as well, which is that if people think that they can consign a great deal of the discussion, let's say, about important issues to the private sphere, yeah. Firstly, it doesn't mean what they're saying is actually going to be any truer. And secondly, they get into the, they get, they can easily get into the habit of sequestering their true thought from everybody else if it is indeed their true thought, uh, and so on. And that, and, uh, and that, and that's a problem. I'm quite torn about this. Um, I, I fully recognise the, the need for the private space for you to think about things and reflect and, and come to your own decisions about um, what you think about the world. But then I think there's often been nowhere for that. So once you've made that decision, nowhere for it to go. Um, you know, you, we've all heard the, uh, the, the phrase, if you want to get on with people, don't talk about politics or religion. And I think that's pretty widely observed by people in their day-to-day -day relations with each other. So one of the things I like about Facebook is I think people are starting to say what they think about things, having thought about it privately. Um, often then it just kind of goes out into the ether, but then it gets seen and maybe debates will come out of that. So I think it's a good start. Uh, a number of the panellists have expressed uh, concern about um, uh, companies using uh, data for capitalist purposes. What is the concern? I mean, for me, uh, if companies are being responsive uh, and wanting to know how they can offer a better service and if they make a profit, fine. What is the concern about Google knowing more about me so they can offer a better service? I'm not sure. So the public-private couplet, I'm not sure that privacy is just simply the private. So I think privacy is, is as much something that we give to other people as, as something that, that um, we should be entitled to ourselves. People talk about it, um, or are talking about it simply as like the leakage of information and this kind of thing. And I think that's going to happen. It always has happened. You know, it's the basis of most Mike Lee films, you know, where you kind of work out that people are getting divorced and having affairs and all the rest of it. But privacy is about us. Maybe we're going to ignore the fact that they got drunk at the office party and we're not going to mention it uh, when they come for their pay review and that kind of thing. So privacy is kind of both ways round. And I think learning to look away is, um, it, it, you know, whether it's in the urinal. Uh, there's, there's a, Back to the sex But we do. Right. We, we evolve it. People, people work it out. I mean, there's a, you mentioned the Romans defecating together, but there's a scene in All Quiet on the Western Front where they defecate together and they talk about their bowels and they, you know, they just sit around and chat. And that was, you know, First World War. So people work these things out and, and uh, privacy is a kind of fluid thing. But I think public-private, and, and, and I think it's fluid along that spectrum, but public-private is kind of a different thing. And I think it's not just the mass coming off when we go into the private sphere. We, we also um, get the chance to be something else as well. I think you can, um, you know, uh, when, when I walk in the front door, I get a, a, a great reception from children, dogs, and uh, sometimes my wife. Um, <laughs> and very different to when I walk into the office. You know, I can be something different at home. I can be the uh, aspiring guitar player or whatever, you know. So it's where children learn to become this thing that they will eventually be in, in public. Um, there's that great Shakespeare sonnet, you know, my, uh, my love swears that she is made of truth, which is all about this idea that you kind of lie to each other. You're getting old, but you still say you're attractive. It's, uh, you know, in every home across the country, children are saying to their mum they look great before they go out. So it's, um, it's uh, not in hours. No, okay. no, they do. <laughs> so, so it is a place where you can try on different things as well. It's not just the mask coming off and, and you, you sort of... And I think the, the, the two are being blurred. So the public, uh, the values from one are crossing over into the other. We're being judged in public on our private... Uh, just That's on the, uh, the right. Google yeah. thing, uh, there was a lot of nodding uh, that happened when I think the point was made about all oh, the, the, the gathering data to sell, uh, for capitalist purposes. And I think ultimately the, the worst thing they appear to be doing, all these companies, is trying to sell us stuff. There was a, there was a big thing uh, in London, or big thing, there was a, sm uh, a fire in a dustbin, so to speak, uh, in London when they were trying to use uh, Wi-Fi to detect what you were, who you were and adverti using advertising on bins to sell you stuff. It was a huge, well, huge. There was an 
outcry about this because, you know, it seems to be an outrageous thing to do. And yet Ursula seems to have no problem with the state invading our privacy or, or at least as uh, policing us as far as, you know, terrorism, etc. is concerned. Well, and I think, that, hang on, hang on, I think what that indicates is that uh, it's a suspicion of people and a lack of trust in each other. Because what you're saying is, what people are saying is that, oh, we're too stupid to resist the advertisers and we're also too stupid not to want to go out and plant bombs and kill each other. So I think there's a real uh, lack of uh, faith in humanity that's, that's uh, uh, exactly summed up in your attitude, Ursula. Which okay, I said that... I was open to the, to open to the counter-argument because I understand that maybe my ideas might be naive and over-trusting. Okay. okay. I think we're going to leave our children with the moral questions of how we want our world to be going forward. As technology increases, as um, your personal data uh, from uh, medical records are kept uh, a move from, from <coughs> the doctors to your personal, you're going to find out, some people are going to find out that their father isn't genetically the same. As you're mapped um, genetically, that could be out in the domain. And then if that is then, in, dots are connected, you then may have a, a, an identity card and they could make decisions on you. No, you're not going to do that or you're not going to be employed because you're more, more of a risk. You know, these sort of questions are going to come out. Just so, touching on something thing. David said before uh, about us wanting to learn uh, about, about other people's lives. It strikes me that transparency doesn't actually give us any real knowledge about a subject. And if you take a look at the sort of final frontier, death, everybody's talking uh, how we should expose death. We have it on the internet. Uh, we have that gruesome circus of macabre corpses going around uh, as if we can sort of gain some sort of insight. And yet nothing really is learned about death. You cannot understand death without understanding the person whose life ha has gone. So all of this focus on death has not given us any, any sort of insight <coughs> at all. And it seems to be, if anything, <coughs> the extra transparency is confusing the issue and leading to less understanding. I think in some ways the damage has already been done to intimacy. I mean, if you're a parent, you certainly, you may not be aware of it, but there's always a third person kind of in the back of your head or maybe kind of up here who's always evaluating what you're doing and wondering what the consequences are going to be. Um, so that because we've internalized this idea that there's something a bit <coughs> risky about our relationship, our intimate relationships, it means there's almost like an inner policeman there. And, and, it, and it just, it, it's even if, even if it wasn't codified in law, it's there. You can't get away from that, that self-examination, which is not coming from you, but it's coming from this wider mistrust of intimacy within society. So, panel, in the order in which you spoke, Christine, give us your, your final thoughts to the audience, please. Okay, I'm going to say something positive and then something negative. Uh, the positive first. Uh, this, these issues, there, there is some optimism here. Intel, the uh, chip maker, just did a, a multi-country survey about people's feelings about technology. One of the most interesting findings is that people aged 17 to 24, who were basically suckled at the teat of technology since birth, don't know a world before Facebook, they agreed much more strongly with the statement that technology is making us less human. And by that they meant we're too reliant on it, we need to think more critically about it. These are, this I found to be very optimistic. This kind of questioning is happening in the very generation where we're most concerned, I think, about the future. As for the negative, for every single person who says, oh, what's the big deal, Google's just trying to sell me a product, Amazon's trying to sell me a product, Facebook's trying to sell me a product, you are the product. And you should be concerned. And in the US, we're already seeing litigation linked to um, whether people can get health insurance based on their patterns of behavior. And this is what the technologists do want to do. They want, they're not just concerned with selling you something you, they think you might like on Amazon. They are going to link it to your everyday behavior, your private choices, and there will be data to track that. So I do think we should not at all be naive. If this was an oil company, or a tobacco company, or a gun manu or weapons manufacturer, we would not believe for a minute when their CEO said they were trying to improve the universe. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, Andre? Yeah, uh, I'll do one positive and one negative too. Uh, and I very rarely do positive, but I'll try. Uh, <laughs> I agree, obviously, with everything Christine says. Um, but I, I, it is a weird world where the more, transparent the, the more transparent a world we're creating, the more we have a crisis of trust and authority. And we need to make sense of that. And we need to figure out how to to, to reinvent opaqueness 
in, uh, in, a, in a world which is too bl brightly lit. Foucault said, and I always quoted him in my book, Digital Vertigo, he said, uh, visibility is a trap. I think the opportunity, I, I think Christine's right, I think it's younger generation, I think this is often over-generationalized. Younger generational people who grow up with the web understand this way better than, than my generation. And I think that visibility is actually not a trap, but a mask. And the challenge for the next generation is to reinvent these masks and rebuild darkness. But I think it will come from the web generation, it won't come from my generation. I, I never thought I'd be sort of be per perceive myself as an old fashioned kind of back to basics kind of person. I do use Facebook, I do use Twitter. There are benefits to connecting um, with <coughs> other people out there in the world. But I think that it's so. It's such a mediated uh, form of communication where you choose carefully the words that you put down. You choose the best photos that make you look the most beautiful. And ultimately, when you get out and talk to your people face to face, to your friends, to your family, you can't edit what you say. What, you, what comes out of your mouth is a lot more truthful and a lot more real, and I think we need more of that communication. Uh, first, very quickly, I think one of the dangers is that people actually do believe that your data is you. It isn't. You're not your data. Um, and you shouldn't talk as if you were. One of the things that does actually worry me about metadata is that people will think that they can discern patterns and therefore how somebody is on the basis of data, and actually that's wrong. Uh, the second point arises partially out of the woman who uh, said that she would go to the funny farm. And I felt as soon as she said that, um, don't put that on Twitter. Um, <laughs> And that comes to the point that the gentleman made there about uh, people who are being prosecuted for what they have said on Facebook or on, or on Twitter. Uh, and actually, I don't regard that as being a privacy question at all. And in fact, it was implicit in your question, because you actually used the thing, uh, they thought they had done it privately, albeit in a public sphere. You can't publish privately in a public sphere. You may not know you're doing it in a public sphere, and that is a problem of education, but that's agreed. This is a freedom of expression problem uh, in a society which is cacophonous and increasingly cacophonous and where people are wanting to express themselves and I think it's product of a kind of slight, actually, of a slightly different problem uh, and that's the one, I have to admit, that I care more about. Okay, uh, thanks, David. Frank. I agree with this last point that Dave made. I think there's a, a tendency to confuse questions to do with data and the internet and social media and the privacy question. I mean, there are some big problems there but they're not about the fundamental issues to do with, with privacy. And, and I think that where we are got a huge problem at the moment is that we don't recognize the, the real cultural pressures that exist on the ground. So for example, a lot of my friends are, are very concerned about the sharing of information by the government. But as far as I can tell, there's no campaign in Britain about the fact that patient um, and doctor confidentiality has been explicitly and self-consciously destroyed. And that's done in policy statements. You don't need to have secret, you know, here's uh, Frank's uh, habits. You know, the government just, you know, casually announces that doctors from now will be looking at people that come to the surgery for this and that, you know, you, know, you know, domestic abuse, for how they treat their children, you know, for whether they give their kids too much food. I mean, everything, you know, sort of, that's got none of their business can then be passed on into this joined up kind of meeting. So we have, we now have a situation where confidentiality and in, in all of its ways just kind of given up. And I think that what we're really losing sight of is that the really important issue at stake here is our complicity as individuals in, in the loss of our privacy. We, we don't have to worry about big companies. We are giving it up all of the time. And we're, we're actually uh, sort of sometimes demanding that certain uh, sort of uh, kind of confidential interactions should be exposed. I mean, that's all the political parties are continually demanding more. In Have you heard? Every time somebody does anything these days, we need an inquest. I mean, and the word inquest, you know, used to have an inquisitorial, you know, sort of quality to it in the past. Today, inquest has got this kind of uh, cultural, judicial affirmation about it. Is today really good? Well, inquests are actually, you know, inquisitions into often into people's lives. So we do need to focus in on our our cultural complicity in what's taking place, rather than worry about just the obvious fact that uh, big companies and big states will do what they know best, which is to try to control us. <laughs> Can we thank our panel? Great start to the festival. Thank you.